Awakening Web Assembly and the uh, talk is given by Conrad Ward from the University of Cambridge. Peace. Hi, so yeah, I'm Conrad and I'm here today to talk about our work in specifying concurrency in WebAssembly. So what is WebAssembly? Well, it's a low-level bytecode and it's supported by all major browsers and its aim is to give near-native performance to programs compiled for the web. So a lot of WebAssembly that exists today comes through LLVM, so it's ultimately being targeted by low-level languages like C, C++, and Rust. And the important thing for us is that WebAssembly is fully formally specified, and in fact, the standards body has committed to every new feature having a formal specification before it's allowed into the language spec. So what this means for us is WebAssembly is definitely going to get threads because many people want it. So our task now is to find the right formal specification for this. So let's look at the relevant features of WebAssembly. So a WebAssembly program has a linear memory that's just declared, that's just a raw linear buffer of bytes, and you can read and write to it. And I've given here the small step formal specification for load, ripped straight in a slightly simplified form out of the WebAssembly specification. So WebAssembly's load instruction is type annotated, and WebAssembly's types are really simple. You just have int32, int64, float32, and float64. And when you're accessing memory, uh, you always give it an int32 index. That's just how WebAssembly memory is accessed. So the semantics of load is you give it a single int32, this index k, and then it goes to location k in linear memory, and it reads out bytes until it has enough bytes to make a value of type t, and then it returns the value. And I said you go to index k, but it is possible for this index to be out of bounds. And in this case, WebAssembly just specifies that you get a trap and execution stops immediately. And similarly with store, store takes two arguments, an index and the value you're going to store. And the semantics is that you go to index k and then you linearize the value c and you just put bytes in memory to represent c. And again, that can be out of bounds and you'll trap if it is. So now in a world of threads and concurrency, you still have this linear memory, but now you have multiple threads reading and writing to this linear memory. And this just instantly exposes relaxed behaviors. So in order to properly specify threads and concurrency, we're going to need a relaxed memory model. And now I'm going to terrify you, because it turns out JavaScript actually already has threads, and it already has its own shared buffers, and horrifyingly, it already has its own relaxed memory model. So you may have thought JavaScript was single-threaded, but actually this isn't completely true. And in fact, WebAssembly and JavaScript need to interoperate because the mechanism by which this happens is a WebAssembly memory is exposed to JavaScript as one of these shared buffers. And the JavaScript and WebAssembly standards committees kind of believe that interoperation should just be pretty seamless. And this isn't an unreasonable belief because JavaScript's concurrency is specified at a very low level. The only thing you're allowed to make concurrent are these raw buffers of bytes, not regular JavaScript objects. And what this means for us is when we're trying to make a formal model of WebAssembly concurrency, some of the behaviors have to just be forced by what JS has already chosen to do. So let's look at some of those. JavaScript's existing relaxed memory model is actually relatively sensible. It's based on C11. It provides two consistency modes, non-atomics and SC-atomics. And if you go into the JavaScript specification, you can actually find a little section called memory model. And there's a whole kind of pro pseudocode laid out explaining what they expect to happen with the various consistencies of accesses. So one thing we can immediately do better is firstly, we can describe the constraints in purely formal language. And secondly, we can precisely describe the coupling between these axiomatic constraints and the operational semantics, which is something historically C and JavaScript have both had trouble with. So as I said, the model at its core has kind of some lineage from the C11 model, which means it's in this whole trace axiomatic style. So what you do first is you take your thread local semantics and you annotate them with actions explaining what's happening to the memory. And then you have to collect all of those actions into a trace. And then the memory model will say whether the whole trace is allowed or not allowed. So just as a sketch of what it looks like to annotate um, our local reduction rules, here I have an atomic load, and you can see instead of going into memory and actually operationally pulling out the bits, you just emit this action, and the action just says, I have done a sequentially consistent read at location k, and I've observed the bytes of value c. And this value is just something we've picked non-deterministically at this point, and then later on the, the axiomatic semantics will tell us whether we were allowed to make that choice. <laughs> 
similarly for store, you see instead of actually going and modifying memory, you now miss an action saying, I have done an unordered store at location k, and I've stored the byte representation of my argument c. And you'll notice that I haven't described what happens when these accesses go out of bounds. We're going to come back to that, but for now I'm only going to talk about the inbounds semantics. So once you've defined your annotations on all of the individual uh, small step reductions, you just have to collect the traces. And because WebAssembly has this formal small step semantics, it's just very simply the co-inductive closure of that small step relation. And then once you've got your trace, you say, well, OK, I'm only allowed to observe traces that are valid, where validity is the collection of all of my consistency axioms. So at a kind of a high level, the game we're trying to play is if I have a read inside my trace, I've got to find some write in the trace which explains why I was allowed to read that value. And this is the reads from relation. And one thing that sets JavaScript and WebAssembly slightly apart from C here is that you're allowed mixed size accesses. So you can have 32 64 bit accesses that overlap. And that means you may have to look at more than one write to explain why a read took a particular value. And to explain why a read is allowed to take a value, you have to kind of make sure it obeys certain ordering restrictions. And there are two ordering restrictions we inherit from JavaScript. A very strong synchronization HB, or happens before, and a slightly weaker total order tot, the total order before. And I'm going to explain some of the constraints they put on the model. So as I said, HB is this really strong synchronization relation. Oh, excuse me. I'll go through some preliminary definitions first. So in the same thread, events are totally ordered by HB. So if you have one access and another access in the same thread, you have an HB relation between them automatically. We also, just for convenience, define a shorthand where we say two accesses synchronize with each other if there's a reads from relation between two SC atomics of the same size. And then finally, we just say the following inclusions exist between relations. So if you have one arrow, you're definitely going to have another. Synchronize with implies happens before, and happens before implies total order. So as I said, happens before is this strong synchronization. And the way this shows up in the model is by saying you're not allowed to read in a way that's inconsistent with happens before. This is just very standard from C11. So this shows up in the model as saying you can't have a read from edge going in one direction and a happens before edge going in the other direction. And similarly, happens before says you're not allowed to read stale values. So this second shape is byte-wise. The older store is writing something at location n. You have a slightly newer store also writing something at location n. And then if all of that is connected by happens before, the read is not allowed to read that byte from the staler store. It has to go to the new one. And finally, as I said, tot is a bit weaker. The only thing tot does in the original JavaScript model is to constrain when SC atomics of the same size have to appear sequentially consistent. And this shows up in the original model as this shape, which is saying that if I have two sequentially consistent writes related by tot, and then I have another sequentially consistent read also of the same width related by tot, you're not allowed to read the stale value. You have to read the new one. So I said that WebAssembly is inheriting these bits of the model from JavaScript. But what if JavaScript just does something wrong? In that case, we actually probably want to go back and fix the JavaScript model, and then both models can be correct. So actually, JavaScript standards body has worked with us very well on this. We found some mistakes in the model. And I really have to, in particular, thank Shu Yugo, who's been a great point of contact in helping us to push these fixes through JavaScript standardization process. So just to highlight one particular issue with the JavaScript model we found, this is just a very simple JavaScript program where every access is writing to the same location. And intuitively, there are lots of atomics here, and it's very well synchronized. And you would think that the access inside the if, the non-atomic read, is only allowed to read one, just through a naive sequential interleaving of the program because you could only have got inside the if if one was written. But actually, the JavaScript model, as it was originally stated in the specification, allowed you to read two in the non-atomic, even if you had entered inside the if. So that's clearly a violation of SCDRF, which is this um, property you want of a model which says that roughly, if a program is sufficiently synchronized, you should just be able to pretend it's a sequential interleaving rather than having to deal with the full memory model's general generality. So for reasons of time, I won't go into this in too much detail. But here's the diagram that explains why this execution is allowed if you just push through all the axiomatic rules I showed you before. And the core underlying issue here is that JavaScript is missing a particular shape that needs to be disallowed, where 
if you have a read which is fully synchronized with some SC writes, even if the read itself is not atomic, it still needs to, in some sense, obey the total order. So here you have the read where it's HB um, after both of the writes. And you have a sense of one of the writes being stale because it came earlier in TOT, but the original model wasn't respecting that. So by adding this shape and others, we have managed to prove that the revised JavaScript and indeed the WebAssembly model are SCDRF. So just quickly before I go on, we do have thin air executions. This is kind of the elephant in the room. We can't avoid it, and this is just a very well-known constraint of C11 style models. If you want to be able to compile efficiently, you have to have some kind of thin air. We only have thin air when you have racing non-atomics, so we do at least do a little bit better than C11, but we should do even better, and we're always on the lookout for new things that will allow us to get rid of these executions. So now for a slightly more unique part of the WebAssembly memory model. Um, I already said that we, I kind of skipped over how bounds checks were going to work in this concurrent world, but one of the interesting things about WebAssembly is that the bounds don't stay static over the lifetime of the program. As the program is executed, you can get these memory growth instructions, which will give you extra length of the memory. And this means actually because the bounds can change over time, we need to start thinking about how does that interact with the memory model? How does information about the bounds propagate? And does it have to be in a relaxed way? So here's a kind of a key motivating example. This is a standard message passing shape except that the flag you're setting isn't data, it's instead, am I in bounds? So to intuitively describe this program, in the left thread, I'm storing a value into X, and X is on a page. These little slots represent pages, which are WebAssembly's unit of allocation. So X is in a page which is in bounds. And then I'm going to grow two more pages worth of memory. And then in the right-hand thread, I'm going to load Y. And Y is just an index. And I've said, Y is an index which is out of bounds before the grow and in bounds afterwards. So the question is, if Y succeeds, if Y doesn't say I'm out of bounds and trap, does that guarantee that you observe 42 or can you observe something older? So in order to work out how strong we're allowed to make the model, we have to look at some real implementations. So here is the most naive implementation you could probably think of. And some engines have historically used this and continue to use it on mobile devices, where you pre-allocate as much memory as possible and then you keep track of a fake current length location that you explicitly bounds check against every time you do a WebAssembly access. So to kind of render my previous example into pseudocode, now you can see that I've explicitly guarded every load and store with a check to see if the length is large enough to do the access. And if it's not, I go to this trap location. And I've replaced my memory growth with an atomic update to the length. So unfortunately, if you compile this to some architectures, you really do see the relaxed behavior where you can have the bounds check succeed, so Y successfully reads something, but then X sees a stale value, so it doesn't see 42. So this instantly tells us that we're not allowed to make our bounds check sequentially consistent. We have to do something weaker. So as I said, this kind of gives us an intuition for how we want to model this. In the full spec, instead of just saying, I'm emitting an action that describes how I access data, Every memory access also has to emit an action describing how it accesses the length. And that has to be not sequentially consistent. So we just make it unordered consistency, because that's the other consistency mode we get for free with the model. So you'll notice here that our load is now deciding whether it traps or not based on whether it observes a length of a sufficient size from this distinguished length location that we have abstractly in the model. And memory growth itself is modeled as a sequentially consistent RMW on this distinguished location. And we do provide a memory size instruction, which lets you observe the size of memory in a synchronized way so that you don't get these weak behaviors if you put in the explicit checks. So now I want to talk briefly about a slightly more efficient implementation that we have a bit more trouble reasoning with. So this is an implementation that takes advantage of page protection and some other OS facilities. Uh, one thing you can observe with WebAssembly is that because all of your indices are 32 bits, on a 64-bit <coughs> architecture, you can actually reserve the full addressable space of WebAssembly in virtual memory, just reserve two to the 32 byte locations. And then what you can do is for all of those indices which are beyond the bounds of WebAssembly's linear memory, you just read-write protect them. And then what this means is out-of-bounds accesses are turned into protection errors in the operating system. And you can catch these faults and convert them back into WebAssembly traps. And this allows you to avoid having an explicit bounds check. So you can see, I kind of still have my bare loads and stores. I don't need the explicit if bounds check anymore. And my uh, memory growth 
has been rewritten to unprotecting the relevant pages to kind of simulate this memory now being accessible. And still off to the right hand side, I have all of my protected memory that I've reserved. And then again, off to the side, if I do trap, I have to go into this protection trap handler, which will tie up all of the WebAssembly state and get it back in a reasonable um, position and then return with a WebAssembly trap value. So we actually have a lot of trouble reasoning with this implementation. Intuitive, well, experimentally, nothing's gone wrong so far. And intuitively, it should be stronger than the naive implementation because unprotecting memory implies this kind of TLB shootdown where you have lots of threads being interrupted and doing barriers. But in the literature, there's not really anything that lets us formally prove that this implementation is conformant to the spec. So this is kind of our plea for help. Uh, we want some kind of model of TLBs and exceptions and interrupts that will allow us to verify this. So just to conclude, there are some missing pieces to the puzzle of verifying that all implementations are correspondent to our model. One of the most fundamental ones is that, as I said, WebAssembly's model is mixed size, and there aren't that many models of mixed size architectural relaxed behavior. We have an operational one for ARM v8 and power. We do not have a mixed size model for x86, and a lot of WebAssembly is compiled to x86, so that would be quite good to kind of tie up our full formal story. Uh, we don't necessarily have a full picture of the assumptions source level languages compiling to WebAssembly make when allocating objects. We're pretty confident that even though our story for memory growth is correct for C and Rust and low level languages like that, if you potentially have another language compiling to WebAssembly that expects allocations to be observable in a more synchronous way in, in, in concert with parallelism, we don't necessarily know that we've got that right and there may be space where the model needs to be strengthened in order to support all those languages. And finally, as I said, in order to verify this more efficient trap, in order to verify this more efficient trap handler representation, we need to uh, have more models of OS calls, interrupts, exceptions, virtual memory, TLB, all of this nice stuff, which no one's touched so far. So that's everything. Uh, any questions? Thanks for the talk. Um, two questions, hopefully the first one's quick. You mentioned some forms with respect to kind of the relationship between rights. So I think you came to my talk yesterday. So how much of coherence appears from C11 in your spec? Ah, okay, so this is quite interesting. Uh, and this is actually something that was known effectively all the way back to Batty when he proves that the fragment of C11 with just non-atomics and SC atomics doesn't need an explicit coherence relation. So non-atomics don't obey coherence at all. And for SC atomics, the coherence relation is subsumed by them just being sequentially consistent. So if you wanted an explicit coherence relation, the way you recover it is by restricting top to same location SC accesses. And that looks like a coherence relation. Okay. Uh, my second question was, you, you had a counter example, like you had this example, the yeah. counter example in the slides. You want slides. me to scroll back to it? Uh, sure, if you like. Um, and then what you did was you basically added a new, what amounts yeah. to a new axiom. Do you, are you working to, like this is sort of the story of memory model, somebody comes up with a counter example and then you have to tweak things. What are you doing to like explore the space of possible troubling programs, I guess? Ah, so I, I should talk to you offline about that because there's some ongoing work going on. But as far as whether these particular axioms that we've added are reasonable, um, this is, it, so interestingly, there's a, there's a kind of a dual issue that showed up in a draft of the C11 memory model. And again, Mark Batty uh, proposed a particular fix which looks like this axiom but flipped the other way around. Right. So we also need this axiom and this axiom. So this is because in WebAssembly, you're allowed to arbitrarily mix non-atomic and atomic accesses on the same location. In the C11 model, you can't do that. So we have some intuition that because the axioms were correct in C11, they should be correct in our model as well. But I should talk to you more about ongoing work and properly verifying them. Okay, thank you. So you talked a lot about this property with um, whether uh, Crow synchronizes with another thread and whether you can see things before that. But this seems like a very crazy property. Isn't the thing you usually are looking for is the opposite, that, that if you have, have a grow and then synchronization, can I be sure that the load doesn't, uh, isn't considered out of bounds after that? Right? Ah, I see what you mean. So uh, that just falls out as a natural consequence of us modeling uh, growth as regular reads to this made up location. Right. So if you do have a synchronization in between a growth and a read, you'll have a synchronization edge, and this will mean that 
you have to observe things that are consistent with happens before. So you're guaranteed to be able to see that value. Right. You could see a newer value which you're racing with, but that would only allow you to access more things because the memory grows monotonically. So I would argue that this is sufficient to implement almost all programming languages already. Right? Yeah. We hope so. If, if you have a counterexample, please come and talk to us. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't actually know enough about WebAssembly, but does WebAssembly make any um, restrictions on alignments of loads? And if not, has this presented a problem? Because, you know, architectures that don't, yeah. So atomics have to be aligned. Non-atomics don't have to be aligned. And there, there were some rules that kind of deal with exactly what you get if, a, if an access is aligned or non-aligned. I didn't go into details in this talk because they're really annoying. Okay. Um, but yes, th there are some kind of rules about when you can view an access as just one access or whether it can get split up because, say, on a 32-bit uh, architecture, you might implement 64-bit accesses as two 32-bit accesses, right. you know, something like that. Or on ARM, um, unaligned accesses get split into bytes, this kind of thing. Right. Um, yes, it's in the model. We definitely have it right with respect to what JavaScript is willing to assume about which architectures it cares about. As WebAssembly becomes more common on embedded systems, it may be that we have to revisit some of our assumptions about tearing. But that's just the parameters of the model, so it can be tweaked without fundamentally altering anything. Okay, thank you.